Okay, good morning. So today we'll be uh, more focused on on a specific topic, which is the cosmogenic nuclides. We'll see in the morning uh, the theory and also the the application. Well, no, all the application, but uh, the main application of the of the cosmogenic nuclide, basically for dating object in geomorphology and also for measuring erosion rate. And then this afternoon, we will uh, make some uh, exercise to get uh, familiar both with the uh, dating technique, for example, for terraces, and also in the second time to uh, look how we can calculate erosion rate from uh, cosmogenic nuclide taken in a, a scoop of sun, of river sand, and how we can calculate uh, erosion rate at the scale of the basin with just this, uh, the cosmogenic nuclide taken in this scoop of sun. Okay, so first part, I will uh, present the great principles behind the theory, and it will give you a uh, uh, some insight of about how it works, but oh, how, what are the limitations in some way, or uh, the important things to have in mind when you are using this kind of um, this kind of techniques. So, having some quantitative tool to measure erosion rate, but also to measure uh, the age of the landscape is very important. Why? Because during many years, um, I mean, until the, the 50s, when there, were, when there were almost no, no quantitative tool to, to date the landscape or to, to date units, then uh, in, in an absolute term, I mean, because for sedimentary uh, series, there were fossils, there, were biostat there was biostatigraphy to, to, to get an idea of the age of the sedimentary terrain. But for landscape, well, for example, in this kind of valley, there is no deposition. So how can we know that this landscape is uh, young or old? So most of the geomorphologists, the early geomorphologists, they were just describing the landscape, okay, here. We have a U-shaped valley. Here we have a, a, a flat bottom. But here we have also a U-shaped valley and also uh, some former glacial valley. So in both cases, we, we see, we can describe exactly the same landscape, but uh, is it the same age or no? And in fact, here, for example, uh, we are in Yosemite uh, Valley, so the <coughs> The U-shaped valley was abandoned or, and probably partly formed or carved during the last uh, glacial maximum. It means uh, 20, 25,000 years ago. In contrast, the dry valley in Antarctica is one of the places in the world where the erosion rate is the lowest uh, in, uh, on Earth. And uh, if you go there and try to date a landscape, you can end up with uh, exposure age, as the one I will uh, show you today, uh, which are several million years old. So similar landscape in some way, but a very different age. So for that reason, getting a way to measure the age of landscape and the speed of processes was a true revolution for geomorphology, which was a descriptive science and that became an explicative science. Okay. So, in this first part, I will speak mostly about the principle. So, uh, I will present you the cosmic radiation at the origin of the cosmic ray uh, of the cosmogenic nuclei production. We will brief. I will briefly introduce you to the uh, analysis technique. And then, in the second part of the class, uh, we will see the different uh, use of the uh, cosmogenic nuclide. First, the 
dating of uh, exposure age and second uh, erosion rate. And we will see also the principle of a technique uh, combining different nuclides or isotopes to uh, date by what, what we call a burial age. So first, a definition. So what is a, a cosmogenic uh, isotope, a cosmogenic uh, nuclide? Uh, it is an isotope produced by the interaction between uh, a cosmic particle and the nucleus of uh, an atom on the Earth's environment. So it can be an atom in the air, it can be an atom at the Earth's surface in the uh, minerals of the rocks. Uh, we will speak, or you will see in the literature, that we can use in situ cosmogenic nuclide. So this term in situ is uh, reserved for cosmogenic isotope formed uh, within the mineral at the Earth's surface. So typically, we will be speaking of different uh, uh, cosmogenic nuclide, helium-3, neon-21, uh, barium-10, aluminium-26, and chlorine-36. They are the most used uh, cosmogenic nuclide, and among them, the most used, I would say, is barium-10. So don't be surprised if uh, this example with barium-10 is coming uh, very uh, soon. And we speak also about Cosmo, uh, atmospheric cosmogenic nuclide. So this one are produced within the atmosphere by the interaction of the cosmic particle with the atom of, uh, of the air, so in, uh, in particular, uh, the oxygen and the nitrogen. And in that case, there is much less uh, uh, isotope produced, only barium-10 and uh, C14. And we will see uh, why. So at the beginning, we have cosmic radiation. So cosmic radiation was first uh, discovered in the early uh, uh, 20th, uh, the 20th century by Victor Est. Est. He made some uh, measurement in, uh, in balloon, in hot air balloon, and was able to evidence uh, that when you go up in the atmosphere, you receive more and more uh, intensity of this cosmic ray. Then, based on the understanding of the uh, interaction of cosmic ray with, um, with the atom, uh, we discover the, uh, also the C14. And uh, in 49, William Libby, uh, invented the C14 uh, method to date, uh, for example, organic material, and he, he got the Nobel Prize for that. In 91, so the important date, Devendra Lal, so I think uh, a famous geophysicist who was a former uh, director of PRL, I think. So he develops uh, really the fundamental equation describing uh, the cosmogenic uh, isotopes and also the uh, potential use in uh, earth sciences. And at the end of the uh, 80s, in fact, uh, we saw major analytic development in particular in terms of uh, mass spectrometer by acceleration. And this new spectrometer made possible to measure uh, the uh, cosmogenic nuclide so the theory came first, and after that, uh, we got the instrument to be able to measure this cosmogenic nuclide and use all the potential of this method. And you will see that the, the number of uh, applications in earth science has really exploded during the last 30 years. So uh, the experience, the initial experience of uh, S, where uh, to put uh, so photographic emulsion uh, plate in the uh, hot air balloon and send in the atmosphere. And they were measuring uh, some star-shaped trace of cos cosmic particle interaction with the atom of uh, the emulsion. So you can see the secondary 
particles which are uh, produced by, the, by this interaction. And today, there are different systems. They are more like a neutron counter that can be also sent in the atmosphere if you want to uh, measure at different elevation. So the cosmic radiation, uh, there are several types of uh, radiation arriving uh, uh, on Earth. Some come from the sun and some come from explosion of supernova and other uh, object in the far sky. And the two main so, uh, source of flux are the, sol uh, the sun. The sun is sending a very high flux of uh, low and medium energy particle, so between one kilo electron volt and uh, 50 mega electron volt. And the explosion of supernova are sending much uh, higher a uh, much higher energy particle, but with a much more radius flux because of the far distance, obviously. And the nature of this particle, it's uh, around 80% of protons with an uh, energy between one giga electron volt and uh, uh, 10 billions of giga electron volt. A few 10% um, of particle alpha, so mostly helium-4, and electrons, so in terms of uh, flux, 3% uh, of electron. And we can see on this view, the, in some way, the uh, cascade of collision and reaction produced by the interaction of particular of, uh, of, the, of these protons, of this cosmic proton, when they arrive in contact with the uh, atmosphere and the troposphere. So in terms of spectrum of energy and of distribution. So here you have uh, the flux and here the energy. So you can see that the galactic component coming from the supernova explosion is we get a very low flux but very high energy and at the opposite of the spectrum we get the sun uh, ray with low energy, but high flux. So let's come to the cos cosmogenic uh, uh, isotopes. So they are produced mostly by reaction, what we call of spallation. So the reaction of spallation, it's a nuclear reaction uh, due to the collision by an incident particle. So this incident particle basically can be a high energy neutron, a high energy proton, and from an, uh, a threshold energy of 50 mega electron volt up to several giga electron volt. So we will observe this kind of reaction. So you get this neutron hitting an atom. So here, for example, uh, silicium 28 and it will produce or break the atom of silicium and produce a secondary atom, which in that case will be uh, aluminum 26, and it will produce also some particle or some sec secondary ne neutron. So in that case, it will produce an atom of tritium. So tri uh, the reaction, the collision of one neutron or one proton with uh, 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 silicium will produce one tritium and one uh, aluminum 26. In other kind of reaction, you will produce uh, barium 10. And if the target is different, let's say, for example, oxygen, you will get another reaction. But again, you will produce, for example, barium 10 or C14. So typically, there are the cosmogenic isotope aluminum 26 produced by this reaction of spallation. We'll see that other kind of reaction can produce also this, uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, cosmogenic isotope. And the important point I uh, didn't mention, and which would explain one fact I was giving you previously. So because of that reaction, the decomposition of the target nucleus uh, has to be into an atom of lower mass. So you will not produce an atom of greater mass than silicium-28. So you have to produce a smaller mass, so either aluminum-26 or barium-10. So now, if we reconsider the 
what I call the atmospheric component or the atmospheric cosmogenic isotope. Remember, we, have, we can have collision with nitrogen or oxygen. So in the two cases, uh, we have a target atom which is of lower mass than, for example, allium-26. So for that reason, it's not possible to produce allium-26, so chlorine-36, in the atmosphere. So we will produce only uh, a cosmogenic isotope smaller than, uh, uh, smaller than the target, nitrogen and oxygen, so we can produce only barium-10 or C14 or helium-3. So there are one way to produce uh, this cosmogenic isotope. So there is a list here, helium-3, barium-10, C14, neon-21, neon-22, helium-26, chlorine-46, but also uh, manganese-53. Uh, Primary uh, reaction, there are spallation reaction. So on different targets, so for example, barium-10 will be produced on oxygen, barium, silicium. But you can also produce those uh, cosmogenic nuclide uh, by what we call negative uh, muon capture. So I will show you in the cascade of reaction in the atmosphere, the production of, uh, of this muon. So this muon by um, another type of uh, reaction, so in that case it's capture. Uh, you can produce also this cosmogenic nuclide. So, for example, the barium-10 will be produced also by capture of muon on oxygen-16 or on uh, silicium-28 in the, if you are, for example, looking at silicate uh, mineral. And for a few uh, of, uh, of this cosmogenic isotope, they can be produced also without uh, by but what we call neutron capture, thermal neutron capture. So the ter thermal neutron capture, it's for example, imagine a chlorine 35, so the most common uh, chlorine uh, isotope. So it can capture a low energy or lower energy uh, neutron and capture it and becomes chlorine 36 by this nuclear reaction. And uh, in that case, uh, Typically, the neutron, because they are of lower ten energy, you don't require uh, such a high value of 50, uh, minimum 50 uh, giga uh, electron volt. So you can do uh, capture by the uh, particle emitted by the sun. So it's relatively specific, and I just mentioned it, but in the rest of the talk, we will mostly speak about spallation because it's um, the most, uh, the largest contribution to the cosmogenic isotope you can find in the atmosphere or in situ in the mineral. So uh, we will speak in the later part about production rate. So the production rate, it's basically at the Earth's surface, the rate at which we will produce in situ cosmogenic uh, uh, isotope in a mineral. And initially, if you have a mineral and you uh, expose it to uh, uh, the cosmic flux, then the concentration in the isotope will be increased linearly with time, initially, because you are producing uh, the, the target, the uh, atom of your mineral is receiving this cosmic ray, having spallation reaction, and accumulating slowly and slowly the cosmogenic isotope. So we will see after that that for a long time, then we begin to have uh, uh, saturation, uh, so not saturation, but uh, some kind of uh, plateau due either to uh, processes of erosion or due to a radioactive decay for the uh, for the cosmogenic isotope, which are radioactive. So I didn't mention it uh, in that table, but we have basically three isotopes, so cosmogenic isotopes, which are stable, helium-3, neon-21, and neon-22. 
And all the other one, Cosmo uh, C14, barium 10, allium 26, chlorine 36, they present some radioactive decay. Some one very uh, fast, like the C14, with an half life around 5,700 years. And for other one, like the barium 10, with a longer half life, which is around 1.3 million years. So, Basically, the production rate at, the, at your mineral will depend on what? On the flux of cosmic ray arriving on your target. So it will depend basically uh, on the latitude and mostly on the altitude of your uh, sample. Why be, uh, the altitude? We saw that the atmosphere is, uh, uh, the atom of the atmosphere are uh, uh, interacting with the, this cosmic ray. So there is some, uh, each time you get the spallation reaction, then there are secondary neutron emitted, but they are of lower energy. And they are, by this system of cascade, of collision, they are losing slowly their energy. And when they arrive and uh, they have less than 50 giga electron volt, they don't do a spallation. So in fact, there is some decrease of the efficiency of the cosmic ray uh, with when you go down to, when you cross the atmosphere and you arrive down to the Earth's surface. And if you rise in elevation, if you go at 8,000 meter, obviously the atmosphere above it, it's, uh, it's thinner. So you get more, less interaction between cosmic ray and atmosphere. So you get more production. And if you get more production, then you get more accumulation of, cos of cosmogenic isotope. A second thing, it's we see that uh, the cosmogenic isotope, it's a, a result of a reaction between a particle and a target. And depending on the target, uh, you have silicium, oxygen, nitrogen, or whatever uh, other atom. You will get some different uh, 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 percent of this cosmogenic isotope. So obviously, this production rate will be depending on the mineral uh, target. So if you are looking at quartz mineral, you will not get the same production rate for barium-10 than if you look, for example, to a calcite or to uh, uh, another silicate. A convention we take because the production rate depends on latitude and altitude, so depends on the place where you are on Earth. If you want to have a reference, then uh, people consider that the reference will be given at the, by the production at sea level and uh, at high latitude. It means above 60 degrees. So as a matter of an ex example, for example, uh, the production at sea level high, altitude, uh, high latitude of helium-3 in olivine, it's around 125 atom produced by gram and per year. And for the barium-10 in quartz, much less. It's around four atom per gram uh, and per year produced in, uh, in quartz. Uh, so there are the things that... Uh, Excuse me, sir. Sorry. Yeah? Uh, how does it vary with uh, uh, latitude, you are saying? How does this cosmogenic nuclear production varies with latitude? I, I will show, uh, show it just yeah. Thanks. in a few slides. And uh, I need this two slides to explain slightly why it's uh, varying with the latitude. So there, uh, I say that 80% uh, of the, or 83% of the incident flux of cosmic ray, they are protons, so they are charged particle. So, because they are charged particles, they will interact uh, uh, with the electromagnetic field. So, the first interaction is with the sun magnetic field, and the sun magnetic field is uh, shielding or uh, stopping uh, many of the this, uh, cosmic particles, in particular for at low energy, so for less than 1,000 mega electron volt. So you see that here, that will be the normal if you go uh, 
the expected uh, solar cosmic ray, you would, uh, uh, no, what is it? No, the interstellar uh, cosmic, uh, uh, cosmic ray spectrum, and because of the magnetic uh, sun field, you will see that you will be shielding and stopping uh, most of the low energy uh, proton and you will get a, a much reduced flux except in the very high energy uh, proton. So first, uh, first interaction between magnetic field and uh, protons or cosmic ray proton is with sun magnetic field. And second one is you all know that uh, we have a magnetic field for the Earth with the uh, here, uh, the, how do we call it in, in, uh, in English? The, the line of uh, the magnetic field, North Pole, South Pole. And again, because of this magnetic field, the uh, uh, neutron particle, a charged neutron particle, will be deviated or will interact with the uh, magnetic field, will be partly, partially deviated by the force, the magnetic force, and they will be preferentially deviated toward the pole, and so they will have more difficulty to go straight to the equator than to the pole. So for that reason, there is some variation with, uh, in fact, magnetic latitude. And because the magnetic pole and the geographic pole are relatively close, so there is this kind of dependency of the production rate with the latitude and the higher rate of production because very higher flux of proton close to the pole than close to the equator. Uh, so maximum deflection, again, the same kind of idea, maximum of deflection of the, uh, of the particle flux because uh, of, uh, uh, of the geomagnetic field close to the equator and we get a production rate which is around 40% lower than at high latitude. I mean between equator and high latitude. Uh, well, just a matter of uh, showing this interaction of this uh, of preferential interaction of the uh, charged particle deviated by the magnetic field, the northern light which produce either in southern hemisphere uh, close to the pole or northern hemisphere. Uh, I think, no, where is, yeah, so maybe I, to answer your question, so typically it's, this is the dependency uh, of the production rate between equator and the uh, high latitude and this is a dependency of uh, production rate between zero and, for example, 4,000 meter. So you see that every kilometer uh, at uh, high latitude, every kilometer, so when you go from zero one to one, you increase by a factor 2.2, more or less, the uh, production rate. When you go from one to two kilometer, again, by a factor 2.4, 2.2, so between zero and, and, and uh, two kilometers of elevation, it's already a production uh, factor of almost five. And as I said, it's a factor of around 40% uh, less production rate at the equator than at the, uh, at the high latitude. And in terms of uh, how can we uh, know this uh, calibration of this uh, production rate at the different altitude and latitude. Um, it's by measurement, for example, by neutron counter or by also uh, this uh, air balloon. And some also have tried to do some uh, theoretical model. And uh, we will see uh, this afternoon uh, using a, a calculator that there are different schemes which has been proposed in the literature to account for the atmospheric uh, thickness and uh, to account for the latitude variation and also to account for the uh, sometimes the 
fact that the magnetic field is not a true dipole, but there are sometimes uh, a small uh, higher order uh, variation. So this is purely theoretical, and in reality, it might be a small change at the Earth's surface because the uh, atmosphere thickness is not always the same because of the magnetic field is not a pure dipole, but there are uh, quadrupole uh, terms. Etc. And we will see, uh, we'll speak about that uh, uh, again this afternoon. This, this equation P naught bracket LZ equal to ABC. I mean. Oh, so, so, yeah. So basically, because, because uh, the production rate uh, initially has been a. Uh, uh, measure uh, ext measure uh, empirically or directly in the uh, uh, by the system of uh, for example uh, putting targets at different elevation at different latitude and measuring the, the production so people at different measurement at the earth surface and in absence of uh, the the most uh, uh, easiest thing they, they found was to interpolate with a high order polynomials. So it's a third order polynomial in Z, and here there are terms also, I don't remember exactly, it's, it's a fourth uh, order polynomial in latitude. And uh, that it's just a polynomial. So, and the, the different coefficients are empirical, I would say. So I'm just fitting the measurement. And uh, I, the, uh, so if you know the polynomial terms, then you can use in your computation the, the, uh, this polynomial to calculate the production rate. So, I mean, it's not very important to know exactly the, the terms to understand the fixed behind because it, it, it's mostly uh, empirical. But as, uh, again, it's one way to calculate uh, the production rate, and there are other models, but for example, the one called uh, LSD, I, I will uh, speak about later in the afternoon, uh, that uh, propose a different equation based on a different concept. So, excuse me, sir. Yeah. So basically, uh, when we go to the higher latitude, the interaction of particle is less, and that's why we are no, having higher I, production of cosmogenic. No, no. At high latitude, the production is higher than at equator. It's because yes. because uh, when the particle are arriving at a right angle with a magnetic field line, they are uh, more stops or more deviated than the one that arrive uh, uh, at the pole, because at the pole, the magnetic line are uh, perpendicular, almost perpendicular to the Earth's surface. So the, the galactic uh, ray is uh, arriving more or less with the same angle, so it's less deviated and less stopped. So there is more flux of proton, or primary proton coming from the uh, for, uh, galactic uh, space. So there is more proton arriving in the poles than at the top of the atmosphere at the equator. So for that reason, the production rate at the pole is 40% higher than uh, at the equator. And it will depend, and we'll speak a little about that, it will depend also on the strength of the Earth's dynamo. If the magnetic moment is lower, because the dynamo is uh, less, uh, well, is different at some time, then in that case, uh, you will get less shielding at the equator. So the difference between pole and equator can change slightly. And at reverse, when the magnetic dipole moment is higher, maybe the effect of the uh, uh, magnetic stopping will be uh, more important. So you could uh, expect a little more difference between the pole and the uh, equator. Uh, so yeah, so we get this proton arriving from far away, and you will uh, see what we call the Hadron uh, cascade. So 
this is an, uh, a series of uh, collisions. So, for example, the uh, inc uh, incident proton will uh, hit an atom of oxygen or nitrogen, produce uh, some cosmogenic isotope, but also it produces secondary uh, particles, some pion, which uh, becomes muon. We'll, it will produce also electrons, and it will produce also a secondary proton or secondary neutron. And this secondary neutron will hit another atom and produce again a cosmogenic isotope, electrons, a new proton of lower energy, obviously, and pion and muon, and so on. We can have multiple series of impact, and by this series of collision and uh, spallation, it will produce in the atmosphere a lot of uh, uh, cosmogenic isotopes, so I said mostly C14 and barium-10, but you will produce also uh, electron, we are not very interested by here, and uh, muon and neutron, but from the incident flux, at when you arrive at the Earth's surface, you get only 0.00003% of the primary proton. And in terms of secondary neutron, I would say it's around 0.1% uh, that uh, reach the Earth's surface. So most of them are 99.9% 99, 99, uh, of the uh, secondary flux is just stopped in the atmosphere. So in fact, we produce much more, there is much more production of cosmogenic isotope in the atmosphere than at the Earth's surface because of this uh, reduction in, in terms of uh, secondary flux. Uh, it can be put into equation. So you can say that the production rate at a given uh, elevation is equal to the production rate at sea level multiplied by an exponential term that uh, introduces the atmospheric pressure divided by some attenuation length. So you can see here on uh, this kind of uh, measurement. So they were done uh, putting some detector at the Earth's surface. And here it's an elevation of 800 meter hit at an elevation 300 uh, 3,800 meters, and here at the summit of the Mont Blanc, in a, at the border between France and Italy in the Alps, it's 4,800 meters, and you see that both for the helium-3 and the barium-10 production in the target, uh, in the synthetic target, you see this increase when you go up, so when the atmospheric pressure is decreasing. And as I said uh, previously, you get uh, a factor of 2.2 per kilometer of uh, elevation in terms of production rate. So much more production at high elevation than at low elevation. So that makes that, for example, if you go to the Maldives close to uh, uh, the equator and you are at sea level, you will get some low production rate, and you, if you go, for example, in Ladakh at more than 5,000 meters, then you will get around 30 times more production rate at this elevation. So it's a real uh, uh, rapid rise of the production with elevation, much more important than with latitude. So again, the cascade. We get reaction of spallation, production of C14 and barium-10 by the spallation on oxygen and nitrogen. Some fast neutron, secondary neutron arrive at the Earth's surface, just a tiny part, 0.1%, but it's sufficient to produce the barium-10, the helium-3, the aluminum-26, and so on, by spallation in the uh, in the minerals at the Earth's surface. So this one, barium-10 and helium-3, they are the one I called in-situ cosmogenic isotope, and this one, atmospheric cosmogenic isotope. So we can get also neutron capture and also production of barium-10 
in the same mineral by the uh, capture of muon. So because of the interaction between the cosmic ray and the matter, or the secondary uh, flux and, uh, and the matter of the atoms, then what we got in the atmosphere, so the decrease with the thickness, uh, the decrease of production with the thickness of uh, uh, atmosphere but uh, crossed by the secondary flux, we got exactly the same in the rocks. So when um, you consider the Earth's surface, if you go down, 50 centimeter, one meter, two meter below the ground surface, then the flux of the uh, neutrons is, high energy neutron is decreasing very uh, uh, rapidly in some exponential manner with the uh, depth. So we get again some attenuation lengths, and this time it's not pressure, but the uh, thickness of material uh, below the ground. And you can see that this is the uh, concentration of barium-10 in the quartz of a granite, and here helium-3 in the olivine of a basalt, and in both cases, it's a sample taken at different depths be below the ground. So zero, here two meter, and you see that it's uh, an exponential, uh, a logarithmic scale, and you see a straight line in this exponential uh, 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 semi-log uh, diagram and a rapid decrease of the decon uh, concentration and it is uh, usually considered that down to uh, two meter almost there is uh, the, the down two to three meter there is almost uh, no production of uh, cosmogenic isotope by the nucleons uh, in fact we still have a little of production at greater depth because of the muon the muon is a particle which is interact less with the matter. So its distance of attenuation, in particular for fast muon, it stands uh, around 10 times uh, higher uh, than uh, uh, for the nucleons or for the neutrons. So when you go, so again, a semi-logarithmic scale, the barium 10 here and here the depth. So the red line here, the production due to spallation by neutrons. So you see that when you are eight meter deep, you have uh, 100,000 uh, times less uh, production of, uh, for example, barium-10. So very quickly, in at uh, below three meter, you produce less than 1% of what you produce at surface. So this contribution is becoming negligible. But at a greater depth, so below three meter, and you see because of the attenuation length of the uh, muon capture is uh, the attenuation length of the muon is uh, uh, much higher than below three meter. You still have some tiny production of cosmogenic isotopes because of the muon capture. Um, did I miss something? No. Um, yeah, just. Remember, for a normal density of uh, normal density of rock around 2.7 uh, gram per cent, uh, cubic centimeter, uh, at below 63 centimeter, this is more or less uh, attenuation uh, uh, exponential attenuation uh, depth. So below at 60 uh, centimeter below the surface, the production rate is divided by around 2.7. It means exponential one. So now I told you that uh, you get this neutron interaction, production of uh, barium-10 or helium-3 or, or cosmogenic isotope. So what is what? What do we do with that to get a chronometer? a way to measure erosion rate. So first we have to uh, look at the uh, equation that govern the evolution of the concentration of uh, your cosmogenic isotope in the, in the mineral. So let's call it this, uh, this concentration uh, C. So I, here I call it C in, in another slide, I call it N. 
so uh, before uh, calculation of this uh, erosion rate from uh, uh, yeah beryllium do you do we do we have to worry about the production of beryllium 10 by different process like spallation and muation will it going to affect the uh, erosion rate is it a valid question the production of beryllium 10 yeah, by another mean by another way uh, yeah production of beryllium 10 is uh, that i found that there are two ways one yeah. is spallation and muation yeah. so will it uh, do do, it, do i have to worried about these different types of production uh, uh, while calculating erosion rate y yes and no i would say Yes, uh, no, because uh, if you are looking, for example, uh, uh, just dating a surface, uh, you see that the contribution at sea level, high uh, latitude, and uh, if you go at uh, high elevation, it's worse. So if you consider uh, at sea level, the contribution due to the muon capture is around 1% for barium 10 in quartz, it's around 1% of the production due to spallation. So 1%, it's, you will see that you are within the error bar of just the measurement. So sometimes you can just, uh, don't, uh, it's not necessary to care about the muon production. So it's for dating a pristine surface. But we will see that, for example, uh, when we calculate erosion rate, so we'll see that with the equation. Then uh, the term of uh, attenuation length is uh, becoming important. And in that case, at sea level, again, uh, if your surface is in a steady erosion, and we will see that we get some kind of concentration related to the erosion, in that case, the contribution of the muons can become around 20-30%. So it's in that case, it's become important to account for the muon production. And for different isotopes, it can be also important, in particular uh, for the C14, in situ C14. Well, you are all familiar with the use of C14 in organic material. So it is a C14 which is produced in the atmosphere, mixed uh, with a C12 and C13 in the atmosphere, incorporated by the uh, vegetals, and then after by the animals. And when the, uh, the, the vegetal die, and you bury the, the, this organic material, then the C14 is decaying. But the C14 initially is coming to the atmosphere and is due to the production by cosmogenic uh, ray and, and, and spallation. And, but you can have also C14 production in quartz by spallation reaction and by uh, muon capture. And well, for, uh, it's a really a small uh, production, a few atoms per gram per year. So during many years, it was not possible or uh, people was not measuring it. But for the last, I would say almost 10 years, people have begun to use what we call in situ C14. It means the C14 produced within the quartz, for example. Why do I speak with uh, of the C14? It's because in that case, uh, if I remember, well, the uh, production of C14 by muon capture is around 15 or 20 percent of the uh, production uh, due to a, a spallation reaction. So for C14, yes, you have to care about uh, muon production, and in particular, if you are dealing with uh, erosion. But uh, it's, uh, it's not a problem. It's not a problem because as long as you know the production of due to neutrons and uh, you know the production due to muons, and as, as long as you have an equation to en encapsulate the different parameter and variable, you can calculate the things. It just makes the equation more complex to handle with. The, the erosion rate equation that is you are going to show there this correction will be there. Uh, for most of the equation, I will show you just to avoid complexity and to be able to write it on the uh, on on the screen. Uh, I will don't. Uh, I will just present the spallation, but uh, the the muon production the production due to muon capture 
Yeah, I will show just one equation uh, how we can uh, solve it. It's not, not very more complex. The, the complexity, it's mostly uh, for when, when we are interested by chlorine 36 because there is a good, uh, sometimes there is an important contribution of uh, neutron capture, of thermal neutron capture, and in that case the equation becomes uh, huge and uh, tremendous uh, to handle, so that's, it's really complex to, to, uh, to explain. But uh, because most people use uh, barium-10, because quartz is the most common mineral in the world at the Earth's surface, so, uh, and because it's, uh, it's now well known, the technique to uh, isolate the barium-10 and measure it, so it's one of the most uh, used technique, and for that reason, uh, I will focus on just this this part, and we'll, I will not speak about chlorine thirty six today. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so it's uh, to describe the evolution of the concentration in O mineral. It's uh, just a matter of uh, mass uh, conservation. So what we get one term of production due to the uh, uh, spallation reaction. If we deal with barium-10, we have to care about the radioactive decay. I told you that the half-life is 1.3 uh, uh, million years. So we got a t uh, uh, production term and we get a loss term, or term uh, uh, a loss due to the, uh, to the radioactive decay. And this is the variation of the concentration. So variation of concentration, it's gain minus loss. This equation in uh, the case where, so this is, Let's consider a surface, and you are interested in one mineral. So this is a uh, equation for one mineral located at some depth small z. But if you get erosion of the surf of your surface, then it's like. Your, uh, your mineral get closer to the, to the surface. So in that case, small z, the depth is changing through time. So we can have these formalisms, or we can consider another formalisms and just consider a fixed uh, z, and we are just interesting by the evolution of the concentration, for example, at the surface or at a given fixed depth. And if we have erosion, then it's like the material coming through that, uh, that point. So we have two descriptions that I will call, call it a, a Lagrangian and Eulerian description, whatever. The important thing is here, z is the fixed, uh, at, it's at a given fixed depth. So it's this variable is independent of the time. So this is important because here we are recasting this equation into this one to get rid of the fact that the position of your sample can change through time relative to the ground surface. So here, we get a variable z which is independent of time. And in that case, we, uh, the equation we have to introduce, so this term which corresponds to the erosion term. So in that case, we get, if we are interested at a given elevation below the ground surface, if we are interested at the evolution at the concentration, so this change of concentration will be uh, one gain term, which is the production uh, by uh, 
cosmic radiation uh, by spallation, one loss term, which is a decay by radioactive decay, and one uh, term uh, related to the uh, erosion. So basically, if, uh, yeah, if you consider a mineral like here, if you have erosion, so it's arriving closer and closer to the surface. So initially here, its production will be low if it's at two meters deep. And when it's arriving close to the surface, it's, uh, the production it will be uh, receiving will be increasing and increasing. So we are taking care of this term by uh, taking care of erosion. And solving this equation give after uh, integration this kind of uh, uh, solution. So the concentration in the cosmogenic isotope at a given depth, so its evolution in, uh, in function of the depth and the time, is equal to the initial concentration of your sample. So if, for example, we'll see that for sediments, we can have some initial concentration uh, in cosmogenic isotope, plus this term that uh, account for both the radioactive decay, the time, and the um, attenuation length with depth. So it's another way to present the equation. So I replace here, it's not uh, the concentration, but the number of atom per gram. So it's not C, but N, but it's the same equation. And here, so we have the number of atom per gram at a given depth and uh, at time t is equal to the initial number of uh, uh, cosmology isotope multiplied by some decay term, so due to radioactive decay, plus the production divided by the decay constant plus some coefficient absorption, which is mu, which is uh, rho, the density of the rocks divided by the attenuation length. And uh, so we have this exponential decay of the concentration with depth due to the uh, attenuation of cosmic ray with depth. And this term, which uh, include the radioactive decay or the saturation of the concentration due to erosion. So this is the only place I will show you the difference uh, um, the, um, to answer to your questions. If we want to consider the muon contribution, this equation I presented just uh, before become this equation. So it means that instead of, well, we have the same term with the initial concentration, which decay with, uh, 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 by radioactive decay, plus three terms of production one term due to uh, nucleons and spallation, and the two other term due to uh, capture uh, muon capture with, so some people consider that we have two types of muon, stopping muon and fast muon. So for that reason, we have three terms, and it is the same uh, uh, exponential decay with depth, so the only difference is the attenuation length for the muon will be much higher than for the uh, nucleon and the spallation reaction. And the second term, which is different, is the production rate, obviously, because here, if we are in sea, at sea level, typically, uh, this production for the uh, spallation will be 100, uh, 100 times higher than the production for the uh, muon. There are the different uh, the graphic representation of this equation for different erosion rate. So if you don't have any erosion, so erosion rate equals zero, then you will get some linear uh, increase, and then it's not represented uh, on this graph, but for a very long time, so from uh, three to four 
the uh, half-life, uh, you will get some saturation due to the fact that all the cosmogenic nuclide you will produce at the same time, you will decay it by uh, radioactive decay. So you arrive to some uh, plateau or maximum value, which is not, uh, uh, we cannot see here because uh, the, this graph explore value up to one million years. So if we go to uh, 10 or 100 million years, you will see also some core arriving on a plateau. This plateau, we will see it clearly when we have a high erosion rate. So here, 0 0.3 millimeter per year, and here it's uh, 0 0.01 uh, uh, millimeter per year. So you see that depending on the erosion rate, you reach this plateau uh, for a longer exposure or short exposure. It means that after 10,000 years, if the erosion rate is relatively low, then your co the concentration at, uh, in your target, in your surface, is almost not affected by erosion. In contrast, is if erosion is high, so you are bringing very quickly the material to the ground surface, so it has no time to accumulate the uh, cosmogenic nuclide, and for that reason, uh, very quickly, you reach some, some kind of uh, steady uh, concentration of any uh, material taken at the surface if you have high erosion rate. So that's an important uh, shape of the curve. Why? Uh, because there are basically two parts. One part where you have a linear increase and one part where you have this plateau or equilibrium plateau. And these two parts can be uh, used in two different ways. Where you have some linear increase with time of your concentration, you can use it as a chronometer because there is during clean between concentration and time. So this chronometer will be used for dating object. And where you get a plateau, you see that the concentration of the plateau is directly linked to the amount of erosion rate. If you have a high erosion rate, you will have a small concentration at equilibrium. At reverse, if you have a low erosion rate, you will have at equilibrium a low, uh, high concentration rate. So you see that if you are able to measure the, concent uh, the concentration, then you can derive in some way the uh, amount of erosion. We can see it here. If we uh, take this equation and we consider, like, for example, that you have a pristine surface. So let's say, for example, a striated rock, a nice striated rock. You can say, oh, I still see the striation. So probably there is no erosion on this surface. So let's remove the erosion. We simplify the equation and we just have this uh, initial concentration plus the production term. And if the uh, exposure duration is much shorter than the half-life of your cosmogenic isotope, in that uh, case, you can simplify this equation and you almost obtain this linear trend I was mentioning. So the concentration at time t is equal to the initial concentration plus the production for, uh, multiply by time. Linear increase with time. Uh, if you get a small uh, pellicular erosion, then the plateau or the steady uh, situation is described in that case by uh, this equation. So you get the concentration equal the production rate divided by the um, uh, radioactive decay, uh, decay constant plus a term, uh, the attenuation uh, length, multiplied by the erosion rate. So you see that here you can get the erosion rate equal to 
uh, a function, a simple function of the concentration you can measure at the Earth's surface. We'll see uh, in the second part of the, the class the different application, either of this part of the curve as a chronometer to date surface, or at this plateau part of the curve to uh, get some idea about erosion rate. And we will see that uh, a last use, it's by using couple of cosmogenic nuclei that present different half-life and that can be used for a, a burial age. So if you want some kind of a, a simple comparison, uh, you can see that uh, uh, the cosmic radiation and the exposure, it's like 10. So when you go to a sun, if you go at high elevation, uh, or depending on the latitude where you are, you will receive more or less uh, uh, sun, sunlight, and you will uh, get a stronger or no tan. It's the same for cosmic flux, depending where you are in latitude and altitude. And the more you spend at the sun, the more tan you get, and the same for the production rate. And when you peel, the tan diminishes, and it is the same uh, for surface erosion, the effect of surface erosion on the concentration or the evolution of the concentration in cosmic, uh, uh, cosmogenic nuclei. So now the method to analyze the cosmogenic isotopes. So first, remember that we get uh, 99. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, nine. Yeah. Yeah. It's not at 10:30. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in 10 minutes, yeah, 10, 15 minutes, yeah. So, uh, so remember that 99% of the uh, secondary flux is uh, uh, stopped by the atmosphere, so you get a lot of production of barium-10 and C14 uh, in the atmosphere, so the atmospheric component. And the barium-10 in particular uh, will be uh, uh, fall, falling on Earth by rain, uh, essentially. And because uh, it likes to, the barium likes to absorb on the mineral uh, very quickly, in the first uh, tenth of centimeter on the Earth's surface, the barium-10 arriving with the rain or the atmospheric will be fixed at the surface of the minerals. And because you get much more production of barium-10 in the atmosphere than uh, on Earth in situ, then if you want to take a, a sample and, and take a, a, a quartz mineral and measure the barium-10, you will get much more barium-10 coming from the atmospheric uh, component absorbed at the surface of your mineral that in situ uh, barium-10. And to measure the exposure age, for example, of your sample, you are interested just by the in situ uh, concentration. You don't want the uh, atmospheric uh, adsorber uh, uh, barium-10. So the first thing to, to do is to clean or remove this atmospheric part. So typically, uh, so it's a very brief, uh, a short description of the chemistry to, uh, in order to measure the barium-10. So the first step is to isolate the mineral. So by different uh, means, you can put uh, a different acid. First, to remove the carbonates, you put a, a chloridic chlor acid. And then to remove the other minerals, you can do a magnetic separation, but you can do also some... Uh, uh, Attack acid attack with uh, different acids. So uh, in France or in Germany, they are not using exactly the same technique. But at the end, you end up with some pure quartz. Then this pure quartz, you have still this um, atmospheric component you don't want. So for that, you are going to remove the first uh, the the first layer of your mineral, the outside part of the mineral, 
And uh, a simple way to achieve that is to put fluoridric acid three times in three steps to remove the uh, external part of the quartz. So around 30% of its mass, of the mass of the quartz will be lost. But at the same time, you are losing the, the mass of the outside part of the quartz. You are removing the atmospheric component. So you are sure that after that, what you are measuring, it's only the in situ barium 10. So then you need different uh, uh, technique to isolate the barium. So first, in order to be able to measure a sufficient quantity of barium, you need to add a carrier. So typically it's a barium nine uh, carrier or spike. You add it before doing some chemistry on ion exchange chromatography in order to isolate the barium. And at the end, you end up with a small target made of oxide of barium. And most of the barium here will be barium-9, but you have a tiny part of barium-10 you are interested in. Uh, I just show this kind of graph to uh, display the uh, quantity of atmospheric barium-10. So you see, most of the atmospheric uh, uh, barium-10 will be adsorbed in the first meter of the, uh, at the Earth's surface, on the, so on the mineral of the first meter. So you have to remember that the production rate is very low, four atoms per gram per year. So it means that the, your barium-10 is in some way diluted in your mineral in, a, a, in many, many, many atoms of silicium and oxygen. So first you have to isolate the, the barium. And then, even in your target of barium uh, oxide barium, you get uh, for around, let's say, uh, one millionth of atom of barium-10, you will have uh, 10 over 19 atom of barium-9. So in order to measure such a tiny fraction of uh, atoms, uh, you need to have an accelerometer, mass spectrometer, uh, to be able to do the measurement. And in particular, one, uh, one difficulty, it's the barium-10 as an isobar, which is the bor uh, boron-10. So there is just one difference of one neutron versus one proton that makes a slight difference of mass. And so if you are uh, measuring the barium-10, because boron-10, it's some, I would say, common, or it's a natural, uh, uh, atom uh, isotope in most mineral. Uh, so even it's not a huge uh, concentration, still it's much higher concentration of boron-10 than barium-10. So even if there is a small difference of mass, usually on this normal spectrometer, the peak of the, the side of the peak of the boron-10 will be uh, overwhelming the signal of the barium-10. So in order to split and to separate and be able to measure the small peak of barium-10 on your uh, spectrometer, you need to have important energy. So this is the separation you can do according to the energy of your spectrometer. So you need to be above three uh, to five mega electron volt to be able to begin to separate the curve of the barium, of the boron-10 versus the curve of the uh, barium-10. So for that reason, people use uh, acceleration max spectrometer, which are uh, you, uh, quite a, a big size. So here, the one in France, in south of France, 13 meter by 20 meter. So you see here uh, the place where you put the target, so it's uh, ionized and sent by uh, electric current uh, toward the AMS. So there is some place where you will accelerate the, uh, the atom of uh, barium. And then there is some magnet to, to deviate the, uh, the particle. So the barium-9 will be deviate and measure on this detector, boron-10 
10 and barium 10, which are heavier, are less deviated so by the magnet, so they will have a different uh, trajectory. And then there is some uh, uh, foil to make, uh, to stop in some way the boron 10 and to get only the barium 10 that you are going to measure on this detector. So at the end, you measure barium 10, barium 9, and knowing the ratio of barium 9 to barium 10 and knowing the quantity of barium 9 you put with a spike or with a carrier, then at the end, you can measure the barium 10. So for example, this AMS in France, you can measure with this energy barium 10, allium 26, or chlorine 36. It's a team of around 15 scientists, including several uh, engineer, permanent engineer and technician. Typically, they can run around 30 samples uh, per day, and uh, uh, including manpower, well, uh, in most uh, AMS in the world, the, the price is around, I would say, the order of $1,000. Uh, uh, dollars. And the price of, the, uh, of this uh, AMS is around uh, $5 million. Uh, so this is for barium-10. helium free it's, uh, it's a different uh, uh, way to measure it. It's also in a mass spectrometer, and uh, very quickly. So it is measured in pyroxine or olivines. And you use a smaller spectrometer, so noble gas spectrometer. So I don't remember, but more or less uh, here it's 1.5 meter. So it's much reduced and much less cost, costly than the big AMS to measure barium-10. And the difference with helium and uh, neon-21, which are the two stable uh, cosmogenic isotopes that can be measured in noble gas spectrometer, it's we have several components. It's because it is stable. So for example, barium-10. Barium-10 at the beginning of the Earth and aluminum-26. For example, aluminum-26 at the beginning of the Earth, there was plenty of aluminum-26. But because of the radioactive, radioactive decay, after uh, 4 billion years, there is nothing left in terms of uh, initial aluminum-26. So we don't care about the past. But helium-3 and neon-21, they are uh, stable. So uh, whatever you go in the mantle and you take some rocks coming from the mantle, then you will get some magmatic component or uh, magmatic component in terms of helium free. And you can have also helium free produced by uh, interaction between neutron produced during radioactive decay of uranium or thorium with the uh, surrounding atoms. So the, if you want to measure the helium cosmogenic, the one you're interested to date the, your, your sample, for example, uh, then you need to get rid of the magmatic component of the nucleogenic component. It's the same for the neon. So what you measure on your spectrometer, it's a total helium, and then you need to get a way to know these two components to retrieve them or subtract them to the total helium and get the cosmogenic component. So the classical way to do that, for example, it's to crush your living. So by crushing your living, you get the gas trapped in the uh, uh, bubbles, in your minerals, or, in the, or the, um, the fluid inclusion. Then you measure the helium-3, helium-4 ratio in, in, the, in the fluid inclusion, which can correspond to the ra magmatic ratio, and then uh, during the analysis of the helium-3, you can also analyze the quantity of helium-4. So you will multiply the helium-4 that you measure by the ratio, the magmatic ratio, and that way you will get an estimate of the magmatic component of helium-3 in your, in your mineral. And then you can subtract it to the total helium free and get the cosmogenic part. So here there is no nucleogenic contribution, but uh, it's another 
correction we can add and we can measure mostly by considering the uh, concentration in lithium, but I will not go into the, the detail here. Finally, to uh, end up with uh, that part uh, of the talk, we have different cosmogenic isotope, and we have for each one different mineral target. Typically, helium-3, it is mostly measured in olivine and pyroxene. It is not measured, for example, in quartz. Why? Because quartz, the matrix, uh, the crystalline matrix of quartz is, I would say, porous for helium-3 at uh, common temperature. So helium-3 will diffuse in the uh, crystalline network of the quartz and will be lost outside of the mineral. In contrast, in olivine and pyroxene at uh, ambient temperature or even at 100 degree, then the helium-3, which is produced by spallation reaction, is trapped into the mineral and will not escape. So we can use it at a, as a chronometer. Neon is slightly a bigger atom, so in that, in the ca in that case, it is trapped also in the quartz. So neon-21 will be measured in quartz, pyroxene, and olivine. Uh, Barium-10 is mostly measured in quartz. It can be measured in other minerals, but in quartz it's uh, simpler. Allium-26, again in quartz. Chlorine-36, it's mostly used to date either carbonate, so uh, calcite, or to date uh, um, volcanic lava flow, uh, because in that case, if it's basaltic, you don't find quartz. So you need to rely on a different mineral. So either you measure uh, helium-3 in olivine or pyroxene, or you measure chlorine-36 in plagioclase or kaffirspar. And you produce chlorine-36 in those minerals because the target, or the element target, atom target for chlorine-36, it has to be bigger. So, for example, potassium-39 or calcium-42, there are two targets or atom target larger than chlorine-36, so they will produce 36. So you can find calcium or potassium in the first part, so you can measure some component of chlorine-36. And C14 in situ, it's mostly in, in quartz. And you have different detection limit and a different application. Obviously, if you deal with sediment, if you deal with metamorphic rock, if you deal with granite, you will be looking mostly, you can find quartz, so most of the time you will be using barium-10 in quartz. If you are dealing with carbonate, you will use carbonate rocks, you will use chlorine-36. If you are finding on your rock surface mostly lava flow, then you will look more for helium-3, for example, in olivine and pyroxene. So, uh, well, it's more or less the same. So uh, anyway, I will give you the, the PDF. So you, you will have uh, the, the graph that remember you more or less the different use and depending on different minerals of a different uh, cosmogenic isotopes. So after the tea break, we will go into the detail of the different application, dating surface and measuring erosion rate. Oops. Sir, I have a question. Uh, as you said in your previous slide that uh, in uh, Maldives, the production rate will be very less as compared to Ladakh. Uh, sorry, what, what, what will be the very less compared no, to? No, no, production rate of cosmogenic nuclear will be very less in Maldives as compared to Ladakh. Ladakh, Ladakh, Ladakh. Maldives and... Maldives and Ladakh. Ladakh. Uh, yeah. So if I am taking a rock sample or, yeah. uh, from... Maldives, is it possible to date that sample by using radionuclear dating? Uh, cosmogenic uh, nuclear dating, yes. That's the only limitation, it's, you see that you have a detection limit. So typically, it's uh, around 1,000 atom per gram for barium-10, running or uh, dissolving around 50 gram of quartz at the end, you can measure uh, 1,000 atom per gram at the very uh, limit, the detection limit. So it corresponds to, in some way, 50,000 atom 
in your total 50 grams of quartz, okay? So this amount of, uh, of uh, barium-10 is produced during the exposure. So if you go to Ladakh, if you uh, look at a surface which is uh, only, uh, let's say, 1,000 years old, so if the production rate is around, uh, let's say, uh, I say 30 times more, so multiplied by four, times. it's uh, around 100. So 100, so it's uh, 100 years, and if you consider 100, year, 100 years of exposition, you will get 10,000 atom per gram. So you are above the limit and you can measure it. If you go to Maldives and you want to um, date a surface which is only 100 years, you will get 100 years multiplied by a production rate around of four. So you get 400 uh, atom per gram. So you are uh, slightly below the limit. So what you can do in Ladakh, maybe you cannot do it in Maldivia, but if the exposure age is sufficient, let's say several thousand years in Maldivia, then you get enough time to produce enough uh, atoms to be able to measure and detect it on the EMS. So it's just a matter of detection that, uh, that prevents you to, do, uh, or to use um, some application for very young age in Maldivia, but for the rest, it's the same. Okay. Thanks. And uh, what if I try for a meteoritic variety in Maldives? S sorry? Uh, the meteoritic variety of uh, cosmogenic. Meteorites. 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 Atmospheric variety. Atmo atmospheric variety. Atmospheric? Uh, it's it can be also used, no, sir? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, whatever the quantity of uh, uh, atmospheric uh, uh, cosmogenic. Uh, uh, Isotope you get adsorbed at the uh, uh, at the surface of the mineral. Normally, the uh, technique to leach or to remove the the external part of the quartz. Normally, whatever is the quant the quantity of atmospheric adsorbed at the surface, you get rid of it. So it doesn't change anything. So we don't. I mean, if you go to Ladakh or to Maldivia, we will use exactly the same technique, the same protocol, uh, it's exactly the same thing. The only difference is maybe for very young surface or very high erosion rate in Maldivia, then you might be just close to the detection limit, so your measurement will be inaccurate. But for the rest, it's exactly the same. You just have to care about elevation when you do the calculation because you have to consider a different production rate. But the, this is the only thing. So it's just in your calculation later on, but during all the sampling and the chemical processing, it doesn't change anything. It is the same. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I have two questions. One, you showed that production rate as a function of, uh, of depth as a function of uh, your, your altitude and latitude variations. Yeah. So you also showed that production rate as a function of temperature. So uh, using- Of temperature, no. Yes, yeah, so as temperature. In one slide, you showed, a, a, sorry, uh, the concentration as a function of temperature. So concentration as a linear, uh, increasing linear relationship with temperature. With temperature? So concentration of your cosmogenic uh, isotopes with respect to temperature. Where, where did, did I speak about temperature? Oh, towards the very beginning. So further. So I, I'll tell you when. In that direction? Back, sir. Uh, towards the start. This one. Yeah. So concentration relation to oh, temperature. Sorry. Uh, that's, I, I didn't, uh, I uh, forgot to translate. So this means in French time. Oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, 
And so another thing was uh, you showed the production rate as a function of depth, in which you said uh, there was a table, mountain table. So the mountain table, the one at, at one meter, uh, below one meter, you have less. Uh. Does it go? Uh, this one. So, so here you said one meter. So we are not considering a rock. Uh, I mean, sorry, uh, sorry. It's uh, this. Uh, did I put it? Uh, yeah. It is called meteoric variantin. Meteoric because it's coming from rain. So this is the atmospheric component. Yes. Yeah, so, so this is in case if you have a cliff. Then no, 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 no. It's, it's uh, one just uh, you dig a pit. Okay. And you just uh, make the measurement. So uh, I will not speak about uh, it today, but uh, some people try to use this barium-10 component or meteoric component as also a way to date a surface. Because in some way, the more time you s the, your sample spend at the surface, the more they receive rain and the more they absorb uh, meteoric uh, barium-10. But uh, yeah, you can have also erosion of the surface and different process. So it's not it's not as reliable as a in situ uh, barium ten measurement. And but uh, for the one you interested uh, who are interested in, I can give you a few reference about paper who have tried to use the meteoric barium ten. But I, I will not speak about that. So today. just to be clear, what I wanted to know is this is a soil sample and not a rock. So yeah. But if you go to rocks, if the rock is fractured and uh, there is uh, penetration uh, by the small fracture of the, of the rain, you will get exactly uh, so the same. I mean, at soil barium 10 at the surface of the mineral. But obviously, uh, I'm, well, I don't know if someone has done uh, a very uh, specific uh, study on that, how in the case of rock, how the at soil barium 10 is dispatched between uh, in, in the rock, is it homogeneous between the different minerals or not? I don't know. But uh, in that case, in Table Mountain, I think it's a terrace surface in front of the high uh, of the Rocky Mountain, and uh, so it's uh, loose soil, and you get uh, rain uh, diffusing, uh, water rain diffusing in uh, all this material and leaving adsorb barium ten at. Uh, surface of any grains at uh, of the soil. Thank you, sir.